My name is Cadet Third Class Elizabeth Bordeaux. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 27th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. At this time, I would like to ask all in attendance to please remove proxy badges. NCLS would not be possible without the support of the United States Air Force Academy, Class of 1959, our flagship supporter, the Class of 1973, the Class of 1974, the Class of 1993, the Association of Graduates, the Air Force Academy Foundation, the Falcon Foundation, the John Lynn Muse Educational Foundation, Earl Enix, Class of 1977, and Mrs. Candy Enix, and many other kind supporters. Thank you for your contributions. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Cynthia willis Esqueda. Dr. Esqueda is an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Nebraska and the Institute for Ethnic Studies. She is a faculty member in both the, soci the Social Psychology and Psychology and Law programs. Her research interests focus on the motivations for and cognitive processes about race and ethnic bias, particularly against America's indigenous populations, such as Mexican Americans and American Indians. Dr. Ulas Esqueda has published num numerous articles, chapters, and books. She serves on the Office of Minority Health Region, Seven Health Disparities Committee, and has also presented at several universities. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you Dr. Willis Esqueda. Make sure and put it up here, right? To get it to change it. So thank you so very much um, for allowing me to speak with you today. I was invited by actually my PhD student, uh, Major Jenna Arroyo, uh, to come to this conference. And so if you really love my talk, it's because of me. And if you really don't like my talk, it's because of her. So just remember, remember her name. So I'm going to talk with you today about um, I see this, well, you see that, the impact of psychological perspectives on race and ethnic views. And when Jenna asked me to come and speak, I said, well, what do you want me to focus on? And she said, oh, just focus on anything you want. I thought, oh, my gosh. Okay, well, let me just strip it down then to kind of some underlying um, ideas and underlying principles that I rely on to do some of my work. And so if you have questions uh, after this talk, feel free to ask me about uh, my research or any other questions that you might have about this presentation. So I'm, awful, I'm re also really honored <clears throat> to be here today because I have had a male relative serve in every single war the United States has ever had from the American Revolution uh, to Vietnam. Um, and in uh, this uh, slide, you can see my uh, great uncle uh, in World War I, uh, my uncle in World War II in the Army, and then my father uh, was in the Navy, and he was in aviation, he was a navigator. Um, but mostly he spent a lot of time at the snack bar. You can see that in that picture right there, uh, or in the officer's club. That's a whole other story. Let me give you a little bit of information about my, and so we, we didn't have anybody in the Air Force just saying, so I'm just gonna count this as our family marker, right, uh, for participation in the Air Force. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Cherokee from Oklahoma. My mother was Cherokee from Oklahoma. My father's English and Irish. Um, and, you know, have you ever taken one of those, you know, um, DNA kits, right? So I took one, I thought, oh, this is gonna be so fun. I'm gonna find out all these really interesting things about my past, and no, I am so boring. I'm English and Irish, and I'm American Indian, that's it. I have no other admixture, so um, I was really disappointed in that. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm Cherokee from Oklahoma, um, and as you can see in that one uh, picture at the top, that's a man named Tommy uh, Wildcat. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, he's what's considered a national treasure 
Um, he is 100 percent um, Cherokee, um, and he speaks uh, Cherokee language was his first language, and he's a carrier of traditions and spiritual knowledge for the tribe. So he's a really important person, uh, and I'm very proud to call him a, a good friend of mine. Underneath that, you'll see a picture of birds because I am very honored to be uh, a member of the bird clan. A lot of Cherokees have lost that. A lot of tribal peoples have lost that information about themselves. Um, so I feel very honored to be able to know that about myself. Um, I grew up in Kansas City, um, and as you can see, that's a picture of the Union Station with the chiefs uh, plastered all over it, right, because of the recent win. Uh, so I grew up in Kansas City. <clears throat> Both my parents grew up in Kansas City. Their parents came up, my mother's family from the, uh, the reservation uh, to Kansas City during the Depression, and my father's family came to Kansas City because of the Depression as well. Um, but they were raised in the barrio in Kansas City, in the Mexican barrio. And so they both grew up kind of thinking they were Mexican. So we went to Mexico every single year of my growing up. I've been to almost every single state in Mexico. Uh, and when I married someone from Mexico, they were thrilled, right? They thought, oh my God, this is just great. Um, so we had a house. Uh, this is an old picture of the Gateway International Bridge, but right down the street from that is where we had a house. And literally on our back uh, patio, you could see the Mexican-American flag, the Mexican flag flying, uh, and the American flag flying as well. So I have a deep connection to Mexico. <clears throat> then I'm just showing you what my favorite pastime is, because it's ton of people think, well, that's totally out of character. I love dirt track racing, right? And I love non-winged sprint cars with 410 engines. I mean. I love that. And my daughter and my niece uh, and I go to those races really frequently uh, in the summer months. So just so you know a little bit, bit about me. In terms of my academic history, <clears throat> um, I like to call myself a first gen and a last gen. So I'm a first generation, actually even to get a GED in my family. Um, I'm the first generation to go to college. I went to a private school, Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. Um, I am the first generation of go to graduate training at University of Kansas. Not I had not planned to stay in that you know, area of Kansas City, but it just felt good. And the program I was in was an excellent program, and, and my mentor was one of the most famous people in my area. Um, but I have appointments uh, at University of Nebraska in both the psychology department and in the Institute for Ethnic Studies. And it's really informed um, the work that I do. I like to call myself last gen because, and I think this is important too for the work that I do, I'm the last generation that grew up for most of my childhood with legalized discrimination. So my childhood is very different from uh, most of the people in here, what their childhoods were like. We lived in segregated housing, um, and you just took certain things for granted that marked what your ethnicity was. Uh, and so the Civil Rights Movement was a big change uh, in, in, this, in our social life. Um, things aren't perfect, but they've changed a lot since when I was a child. We can talk about that more later on if you'd like. And by the way, when you go to KU, if you don't love basketball, that's why I have a basketball up here. If you don't love, go, go in loving basketball, you'll love it by the time you leave. <clears throat> so. My research interests really focus around the origins and ideology of race for categories in the U.S. And let me start out by saying <clears throat> I love the United States for so many reasons. Partly because we have the most diversity of any nation on the planet outside of Israel. And the reason we have so much diversity is that we are constructed of our foundation is immigration, right? So people have come from everywhere with their own ethnic traditions, and it makes us really rich because of that. The good, the bad, the ugly, uh, it makes it all really interesting, and, and interesting for me as a scholar. Um, so I love this nation because of that. Secondly, I uh, study how those kind of conceptualizations, and we'll talk more about that in just a second, how these conceptualizations of race and ethnic ideologies uh, influence what we do. Now, I focus on legal proceedings, so the criminal justice system or on immigration law, historically as well as currently, like what kind of ideological perspectives people have uh, about immigration, you know, how does that influence 
our notions of immigration. So those things are really important to me, and that's what I do in my own work, and that's what my students do as well. But the topics I'm going to cover today are what the meaning of race is, uh, di differences in perceptions. I'm going to give you a little quiz about ethnicity, and we'll see uh, how many questions you get right. You don't have to write this down. This is, and you can cheat off each other if you want. I don't care. Um, this is just for your own information. And then finally, we'll open it up to questions. So, the origins of notions about race, believe it or not, didn't occur until the 1500s. Race is not something that's always been around. Um, people were part of a nation or of a clan or tribe, regardless of what you looked like, regardless of what you looked like. So you would have a cultural and you'd have a geographic place of origin and that cements your, what they called a race in the beginning, right? So people would talk about the Irish race or the Scottish race or the English race, regardless of what your appearance was. Um, but science gets involved in this. Can I turn this just a little bit, do you mind? Science gets involved. And so a man named Blumenbach sets down the classification that we actually use today. We don't even know we use it, but we use his race classification system even today. Um, and at the time that he put that tax taxonomy together, this classification system, they were classifying everything, insects and animals and whatever they could fish, whatever they could find, they were putting them into uh, classification systems. He believed that Caucasians were the most beautiful race of men, so whites must have originated in the Caucasus Mountains because the Caucasus Mountains were so beautiful. So every time you use the word Caucasian, that's what that refers to, is that there's this classification system and that whites are the most beautiful race of men. But he goes even further than that. Um, he believes, this left out of slide. Okay, he goes even further than that because what he does is to set down not only the hierarchy but a worthiness uh, to those different groups so that Caucasians are the most developed, they're the most beautiful, and everyone else is a degenerative species off of that. So Caucasians are the most beautiful. And you're thought to carry this in your blood. So your blood was indicative of your traits and your characteristics. Um, and if you had a trait, then everyone in your group must have that trait because you all share the same blood. And that's where this idea of pure blood and mixed blood and bad blood comes from. And J.K. Rowling knew that very well when she, when she wrote the Harry Potter series, right? She's drawing on Blumenbach's ideology system uh, uh, to, to do this notion of mixed bloods and pure bloods in the wizarding world. So these racial cues then that we develop are thought to be these biological traits, are thought to be indicative of biological traits. Remember this is clear back in the 1700s, Blumenbach is doing this. So these are biological traits, and it leads us to thinking that, for example, the Irish drink a lot, right? Um, and you can go back and find, all, and on the internet even today, all kinds of cartoons about the Irish and their drinking proclivities, uh, because it was something that was innate to the Irish. The problem is that the cues that we use are socially defined. We define what cues we're going to use. And let me just tell you right now, because phenotype does not equal our genotype. I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, in the United States, another reason why I love the United States, we have our own race classification system. No one else in the world shares our race classification system. There may be other reasons that they have a hierarchy or social categories, because every nation on the planet has social categories. But we have our own unique brand, our own unique way of thinking about those things uh, that other people don't share, right? So that's important to remember, because we have developed these cues and they're socially defined. Okay, the problem is our outward appearance, our phenotype, does not match our, our genetic makeup. Those two things are completely separate. The way we look is not indicative of our genetic material. 
So for example, and this is the, going back to the hierarchy um, that he had about the worth, worthiness of groups, we still rely to this day on these kind of taxon this taxonomy of having uh, Caucasians and Indians uh, and uh, Orientals and the Malay and the Africans. We still use this kind of classification system uh, to classify people as belonging to a particular race. So Caucasians are the origin and the ideal and everybody else is a degenerative species. And when you use that word Caucasian, this is what you're harkening back to. However, there are no genetically sound groups. Every person in this room is a genetic admixture. Somewhere something has, else has been mixed in. It may come back that you're all European, but that means you've got these different European even groups within you, right? Because there's no single non-contaminated, purely genetic group on the planet. There are none. Um, we all belong to the same genus of Homo sapien uh, in terms of our genetics. So the cultural and scientific notion of race has changed in definition and meaning over time, regionally, nationally, and even internationally. These issues of what race means have changed over time. This is a picture of children who were um, uh, freed from slavery uh, right after the Civil War. And as you can see, none of them look like they're black. Right. In fact, that little boy had been sold twice, once by his biological father, and then a second time when he was about four years old to another family by the time he is emancipated. And he was about eight, I think, when this picture was taken. But he doesn't look black at all, right? So phenotype does not equal genotype. Um, and that notion has changed of who belongs in what group. That's changed for us over time. The race concept is really nebulous. So Thomas Jefferson, everybody knows who he was, right? Um, in Virginia, the son of Thomas Jefferson, Eston, who's in the middle there, he's the son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. While he was a, a slave at Monticello, he was considered to be black. But he's freed by Thomas Jefferson only Sally Hemings' children were freed by Thomas Jefferson at the end of his life. Uh, and so Eston moves to Ohio. In 1850, he's considered by the census takers to be a mulatto. What do I mean by that? Census takers, when they're taking the census back then, would just look at people and say, hmm, I think they're white. Hmm, I think they must be black. And if you said you were black, or if you said you were white, but you looked black, they'd put you down as black or unknown. they put you down as an unknown right, because they couldn't quite tell. So you had to match, that phenotype had to match up uh, in their notions about what race meant. Okay, so in Ohio he's listed as a mulatto. Then he moves to Wisconsin, uh, where he lives out the remainder of his life, and he's listed as being white. And so John, on the end there, is his son and served during the Civil War, and he lived his whole life uh, as being a white person, right? So these notions about what race you belong to change by where you live, even within the United States, historically as well, regionally, uh, and uh, even internationally. In the past, we have used some major indicators about who belongs to what race. So it was based on your ancestry. Again, that's your blood and your genetics. Who do you come from? And if you're living in the South, you better keep track of what your ancestors were, right? Because that they, somebody could call you into court and say, I don't think they should be able to do this because they're actually black. And you'd have to prove that you were not black. And you better be able to demonstrate that in the courts. Uh, it often came, it often happened, for example, when there was conflict over inheritance laws. Uh, someone would say, well, you can't inherit from so-and-so because you were never married to them because you're black and you can't have interracial marriages. So you had to keep track of what your bloodlines were. Appearance was really important. What if you can't prove your ancestry? Then they go by your appearance. So, for example, Homer Plessy of the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which allowed for segregated trains, right, Segregate, separate but equal train travel, uh, Homer was chosen purposely because he looked so white 
And if race was the issue, he was the least offensive looking person that they could find. He was only one eighth black, but because he was one eighth black, he was black. Juxtapose that with the youngest grandson of Thomas Jefferson over here, uh, the elder man with his sons. He was only one quarter. He was more than that. He was one quarter black. Uh, but he lived his entire life uh, in Wisconsin as a white person. Right? So appearance was really important, and also the region that you lived in. And then finally, affiliations. And what do I mean by that? Who do you hang out with? If you were a white person and you hung out with people of color, people would begin to question what your genetic ancestry was. They would begin to question what your traits must be because traits are carried in the blood uh, and in your ancestry. So if you're affiliating with people that aren't of your racial group, there must be something off uh, and you could be called on it. <clears throat> what did the courts use? The courts are going to use exactly those three characteristics. You can see from 1790 to the 1950s, late 1950s, right before the civil rights laws come in, that they're going to use all three of those things. They're going to use appearance in black. They're going to use how, what fraction of blood do you have, your ancestry in gray. And then when they say other, ODR, what they're referring to is who are you hanging out with? What have you proclaimed yourself to be? And even what your political attitudes might have been. Right? So if you had political attitudes that, were, uh, that had you know, something to do with black freedom or um, ethnic diversity or something like that, you could be called on that and say, well, I don't know, you, know, you hang out with all these people of color and, and you believe in diversity, I don't know. So all of those characteristics have been used even within our courts. So why do we study race? <clears throat> well, there's a few reasons, I think. One is that it has a lot of power and meaning. Even today, when we talk about diversity, we're so far away from when the civil rights laws were, at, were passed, but it has a lot of power and meaning. It has psychological consequences for people even today. And finally, we live with notions of hypo-descent, that blood and one drop rule, right? If you've got one drop of black blood, then you must be. But that one drop rule was used not only for blacks in the Southwest, it was used for Mexicans. It was used for American Indians to decide who would be an American Indian. Still used even for American Indians today, although it's tribally specific um, in terms of the quantum that you need to be enrolled in that tribe, etc. So we, we rely on this notion of hypo-descent even today. And this um, morphing from an, an, a black looking, African looking face over to a purely white European looking face, um, that was in a study. We can talk about that study uh, later on if you'd like to. Because there's differences in the way people perceive those folks and what group they must belong to. But it bothers us in the present. So I think these are kind of interesting to look at. The two girls um, up at the top in the in the left-hand corner are twins, right, are twins. And this is when they were younger. If you looked at pictures, pictures of them as adults, you would never think that the redhead was black, and you'd never think that the girl that looks black was white. But they share the same genetic makeup because they're twins like any two siblings would do, right? Um, so we use appearance still to this day in defining who will be what. The picture in the middle, underneath the word present, is a woman who is a Mexican national at a soccer game, right? We wouldn't look at her and think, oh my gosh, that's a Mexican. But there's a lot of German, people of German ancestry uh, that, that settled in, in Mexico. Uh, and uh, we can talk about that later if you'd like as well. Um, Ortia and Tamara Maori, some of you may remember Sister Sister, the show on TV. I don't know if you, it was in your household, it was in mine with my daughter. They're half black and half white. But because of their physical appearance, we classify them as being black. The same is true for Barack Obama, half black and half white. 
uh, but we classify him as being black. Now we'll get to that later on because in the black community when he was running for, for the first, his first election uh, for president, there were questions in the black community about how black he was. And then they went to affiliation, but he's married to a black woman, right? So these kind of constructs are still with us even today. And then fi uh, finally, Maya Rudolph, uh, whose, whose ancestry is also half black and half white. Half, actually half Jewish and half white, as are Lenny Kravitz and Lisa Bonet and Zoe Kravitz. They're all both half Jewish and half black. So it, it lends itself even to our notions about what racial classifications uh, we make today. So race and ethnicity leave us with a psychological state. There's a history behind the current issues that different ethnic groups have. And I love this cartoon uh, because it's so telling. Um, so my people died because of this flag, and the black guy says, well, so did mine, right? Uh, so it really leaves with a psych different psychological states based on what race classification you've been given. There are, is a meaning uh, of race and ethnicity, and you can determine that in a number of ways. Um, I kept this pretty simple, so I'll just give you um, a couple of really quick examples of this. So I love the Jane Elliott question. Anybody know who Jane Elliott is in here? Yeah. So Jane Elliott, a long time ago in the 60s, she was an Iowa elementary school teacher. Doesn't she look like an Iowa elementary school teacher, right? <laughs> God love her. I had the honor of introducing her a couple of times to give talks. So Jane Elliott has a really great way of showing you what the meaning, the psychological meaning of race is uh, uh, for us today. And what I she did this in an uh, uh, auditorium twice this size. I've done it in an auditorium twice this size. And the question that she puts to people is this. If you would like to wake up tomorrow and live the way that we treat blacks and Mexicans in this country, or, or gays and lesbians, pre please stand up. And nobody ever stands up. And she says, I don't think you heard me. If you would like to, tomorrow to wake up and be treated the way we treat blacks and Mexicans and gay and lesbians in this country, if you want to be treated that way, please stand up. And nobody ever stands up. And she says, that tells me something. You know that something's going on. You know that you don't want it for yourself, but you allow it to happen to other people right? Your fellow Americans, you're allowing that to happen to. So that is the meaning of race that we carry with us today from an elementary school teacher out of Iowa, right? You can do this with explicit measures, so you can just ask people to respond about their race ideas. Um, I do that all the time in my own work. And believe it or not, people are pretty forthcoming in telling you uh, what they think uh, about race and, and other issues. Or you can use what's called implicit measures. You can do things without awareness. So I could flash without your awareness an image of a person um, that varies in their what we call race classification. And let me tell you, everyone in this room, if you're from the United States, we all share the same cognitive representations in our cognitive system about what people are supposed to look like who are black, who are Chinese, who are Mexican, who are Indian. We all share in these. Even people that are Mexican know the stereotype of the Mexican and what they're supposed to look like. So if I flash that to you below your awareness and then gave you words that you're supposed to respond to as quickly as you can and tell me if they're positive or negative, what you'd find is that we would be faster to respond to positive words that are white, and we've been, when we've been primed with white, and we would be slower to respond to positive words when we've been primed with Mexican, for example, right? Um, and, and this is called the implicit association test. But people have done all kinds of variations on that test as well. We all share in this kind of cognitive system. Now, let me tell you what's really interesting. This is an aside that I don't have these slides, but people outside the United States don't share. Like I told you, they don't share in our notions. But they did a study where they looked at people from Mexican-Americans immigrating from the United States. They don't have our same categories. 
and give them a couple of years, and guess what? They're doing the same thing we do. And no one has said to them explicitly, now you need to get these images down, these race classifications down. But we learn it through osmosis. We learn it in our everyday wor our world and our everyday dealings. Okay, so that's implicit measures. You can do it from nonverbal responses. So this is a nonverbal test uh, to test for your ethnicity. Um, so you would ask a group of people, uh, are the, who are these people? Are they inside or are they outside? And what are they doing? So how many people say they're inside? Raise your hand. I can tell you are from the Western world. Because if you ask people, people from an Eastern world or from Africa, they're going to tell you outside. Because that tall structure is a tree, because the woman has a basket on her head. And if you ask people what they're doing in the United States, people will usually say, or Western world, they'll usually say whether it's a family gathering. But if they're in the Eastern world or from Africa, they'll say they're listening to an elder from the community tell them what they should do, right? So we have these very different perceptions, and that's completely nonverbal uh, about what we should think in terms of our race knowledge that we carry around. Um, so it leaves us with these different ways, uh, these different vantage points and ways of seeing. We don't see things in the same way uh, based on our race and ethnicity. We just don't. It's a, it's, a, it's a vantage point issue, right? We're not seeing things from the same vantage point. Based on appearance and ethnic identity, we have different experiences. And those different experiences lend us to have different concerns. This is one of my favorite cartoonists. His name's Lalo Alcadez. He's out of LA. And he does a lot of, of cartoons that have to deal with minority issues. Um, but this is one of this, this cartoon is really good. Different psychological histories produce different concerns. Again, this is a different kind of cartoon. This one is hearkening back to the Sopranos. Remember the Sopranos TV show? Many of you may remember that. And one year, the Sopranos got to be the Grand Marshals in a parade in New York City. And so Italians were really concerned that the Sopranos were giving Italians a bad name and just furthering the, the stereotype of that they're all in the mafia, right? So they were concerned about that. But indigenous people, Mexican Americans and American Indians were concerned because it's an, it's, it was on Col a Columbus Day parade because they're honoring Columbus who is not only an, only an Indian killer, he starts the slave trade of indigenous peoples on this continent. He starts that slave trade, right? And he got what's called a encomienda, you don't need to know what that is, but it's a license from the crown to start that trade, taking people back. And his son inherited the, the license from him and furthered that slave trade all across, uh, all across Central and South America. So different concerns all out of the same cartoon. Our perceptions are influenced by our experience. So in this cartoon, this guy has no experience with real native people. So when he sees a real native person, he doesn't know what to think about her because she doesn't fit his stereotype of what a real native person is supposed to be. Different cultural and historical knowledge. So in this cartoon, if you think I'm illegal because I'm Mexican, learn the true history because I'm in my homeland. Most people in the United States don't realize that 70 to 80% of Mexican Americans have never been someplace else. They've always been in Arizona. They've always been in California. They've always been in Texas. They never immigrated. Right? The borders covered them, came over them. They didn't come from someplace else. They're on their ancestral homelands. Another fallacy is that the majority of those folks who are Mexican Americans must be immigrants and they must be illegal. And that's not true either, right? So only a small, small fraction of people um, that are Mexican Americans uh, have, are immigrants, and then even a smaller fraction of that um, are undocumented. We can come back to immigration questions if you have them too because I know a lot about that. So these race stereotypes then leave us thinking in terms of traits and characteristics. Um, and that's what these cartoons are kind of all about, right? So um, how to catch an illegal immigrant, you put some tacos underneath a box, right? You set a trap with tacos. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that eat tacos. <laughs> a lot of people would be caught in that little trap besides just illegal immigrants. Um, or this cartoon around blacks never relax, right? Because they've got this inherent trait that makes them untrustworthy and possibly criminal. Um, or, but dude, I'm honoring you. So this guy thinks he has, in his stereotype, he thinks that he's actually portraying uh, a native person or the fact that whites are all racist, even their dogs are racist. What if you've got a white dog, that it must be racist as, as well. So they're all stereotypes and traits and characteristics that we rely on. This brings us then to what's called race essentialism and harkens clear back to the very beginnings of this notion of this taxonomy about race. And we're still living with it today. It's a lay belief that race, which is socially constructed, it's not genetic, that race is a reflection of our essence. It's a reflection of our core being. Your race is a reflection of your core being. That is a notion that people live with even today. That it's unchangeable. If you're born Mexican, you're always going to be lazy because it's in your system. And then finally, it's indicative of your traits. So all these different personality traits that you might have would be housed in that racial categorization. And we live with those even today. So stereotypes uh, and this notion of race essentialism are alive and well in our thinking. And it harkens back to the very beginning of the origins of race constructs within the United States. So let's do a small quiz. You don't have to get these right. I've never had anyone get 100%, so don't worry. And you can cheat. You can ask each other, what do you think the answer is? So what group was the first to be sold into slavery in what would be the United States? Any ideas? Excellent. So give yourself an A for the day. Officially, the importation of slaves ended in what year? 1865, 1808, 1780, or none of these? Excellent. Did it end the slave trade and the importation? No. The last slave boat with blacks from Africa was in 1865, the Clotilde, uh, and it comes in. It's the very last recorded one that comes in. Uh, with, a, with an illegal, in quotes, illegal, a shipload of Africans. But guess what? The Emancipation Proclamation didn't cover people from China or indigenous populations. So the slave trade in indigenous people and in Chinese went on well after that, right? Even after the Civil War, because it wasn't outlawed for those folks. So we still practice slavery, we just shifted our, our focus um, from one group to another. Which city implemented school segregation for Asian American children, set up a Chinese primary school, later named the Oriental Public School, to include the Japanese as well, forbid the use of Chinese or Japanese language by students, and persisted in segregation even after Brown? San Francisco, you guys are so smart. <laughs> San Francisco, because the West Coast had a real issue with, in quotes, Orientals. They were very threatened uh, by Chinese uh, and Japanese on the West Coast. Now, Chinese and Japanese don't get along, but they shoved them in the same school, right? Um, so, who was Henry VIII and Elizabeth I? Who were they? King of England and... His daughter, the Queen of England. Everybody knows that, right? Who was Massasoit? I'm sorry, who said what? Narragansett Chief. A Narragansett Chief. And what did he do? Actually, he was a Wampanoag. <laughs> That's right. What does he do? He made certain that the pilgrims were able to survive. He protects them from attacks by other indigenous peoples because he held this confederacy, the Wampanoag Confederacy together. And everybody in here practiced Thanksgiving, my favorite dinner of the year for sure, <laughs> right? 
Well, that's what Massasoit and his entourage are the ones that go and feast with the pilgrims for three days in 1621. By the way, if they had Thanksgiving forever, no. That's Abraham Lincoln's doing. Thanksgiving is only from the 1860s. But it harkens back uh, to this notion of the pilgrims and this, this actual three-day uh, drinking, dancing, and game playing uh, that the pilgrims did with the Wampanoag Confederacy. Who's Samoset? Anybody know who Samoset was? He greets the pilgrims in English. There had already been English slave ships and fishing boats that had been hitting the eastern seaboard, and Samoset had learned English from those English sea captains. So he greets them in English when they arrive. He's the first. He, they let them stay a few days, make sure that they're not going to hurt anybody, and then he goes out and he greets them in English. Um, that's important, I think, for us to know, right? Who's Metoaka? Anybody in here who know who Metoaka was? You know who Pocahontas is? Her name was not Pocahontas. It's Metoaka. That is her tribal name, is Metoaka. And she comes from the Powhatans, and she comes from Jamestown, which was founded in not 1621 as the Pilgrims, or 1620, but in 1607. So Jamestown's even older than the Pilgrims. But in our myth of America, we think the Pilgrims were the first ones. They weren't. Jamestown and Roanoke Island before that, the Roanoke uh, uh, colony before that in 1585. So, yeah, so Pocahontas never went by the name Pocahontas. Uh, her name was Matuaka. American Indian religious freedom did not exist until 1992. Is that true or false? That's true. Yeah, American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed in 1978, but it didn't say which practices they could have. So most native practices were still outlawed and people were still going to jail, over, and literally they were going to jail over practicing native religious ceremony uh, until 1992 um, when the new law was passed. What's the oldest prepared food in North America? Tacos. <laughs> Tacos are the oldest prepared food uh, in North America. And tamales, because it's the same notion, it's masa around some kind of filling, right? It's the oldest, they found them to 8,000 years old. I wouldn't eat those, but they found them that are 8,000 years old. Which group was restricted from immigrating to the U.S. beginning in 1882? Oh, I missed one. I missed one here. 50% of people in the British colony were indentured servants. True. So when people say to you, oh, my ancestors were here in colonial days, which mine were too, right? Well, they were probably indentured servants, and they were so poor, right, that somebody had to pay their way over. And they were held in servitude, slavery, as were blacks at that time at the beginning, held in servitude for an indefinite period of time, uh, and then they could uh, go on their own. Which group was restricted from immigrating to the U.S. beginning in 1882 to 1942? And I'll give you a little hint. The border patrol between the U.S. and Mexico was established to keep them out. No, but that's a good guess. Nope, not the Germans. It was the Chinese. Yeah, so it, Mexico had a great economy, late 1800s. And the Chinese, are the, are, and Japanese too, it's the first time by boat that they're able to get over here. So the Japanese and Chinese both have colonies in Mexico. The Japanese in southern Mexico still have people and that look Japanese, but they're Mexican citizens. And in northern Mexico, there's uh, enclaves of Chinese. The Chinese, the, the Chinese restaurants in Mexico are really good, by the way. All right, they all speak, Mex uh, they all speak Spanish, and they're all Mexican nationals, but they have Chinese food. It's really good. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, but, they were, but we became, the West Coast became very concerned about Chinese coming in. So they set up this border patrol. Because we didn't care if Mexicans came in, but we didn't want those Chinese coming in. So we set up this border patrol between uh, the U.S. and Mexico. And in World War II, we wanted to put airstrips in China, and China said, well, he won't even allow us to come in. 
We only had 100 people from Mexico or from China immigrate between 1882 and 1942. So the Chinese said, well, you know, you're not letting us in. So we said, well, but we'll change. So we, we resented that, um, that ban. Biological differences exist based on race. No, that's false. Which US president had the most slaves and ordered chainings and severe beatings as punishment? At, he's a very big disciplinarian. That gives you another hint. Washington, he received his first slave at age 11, yeah. He was a huge on, dis on being a disciplinarian, both with his troops, but also, um, but also with his slaves. Which state officially ended their anti-miscegenation law in 2000, meaning race mixing with marriage or relationships? It was still on their state books. They resent, even the federal law in 67 had gotten rid of it. Um, it still was on their state books and was, you know, sometimes kind of enforced. Although 40% of the state population believe the law should still be intact. Alabama. Good job. Alabama, yeah. And you'll still see once in a while people refusing to marry folks because they're of mixed race, uh, even today. In the U.S., minorities have lower self-esteem, meaning they don't like themselves as well, um, than European Americans. Is that true or false? Well, it's false. Most people of color have higher self-esteem than European Americans. And the reason for that is that you've got to work real hard to love yourself in a country that doesn't like you very well. So you work, you have, you find strategies and tell yourself, my group is good. Look what we've done. Look what we've survived, right? And so you actually, if you do, if you measure uh, self-esteem, what you'll find is that people of color have higher self-esteem. Uh, than whites do in the United States. Who was Roberto, Roberto Alvarez? I'll just give you this one because I don't think you'll ever get it. It's the first desegregation case for schools. It's in 1931. Most civil rights laws originate with Mexicans, mostly out of Texas. Roberto Alvarez is out of California, uh, and the courts came back and said, no, you can't have separate and unequal schools. Brown was about having separate and equal schools. But each piece had to be chipped away. So this is the first one to address this, where you can't have unequal schools. The two ethnic groups that are indigenous to the United States, Native Americans and Mexican Americans, yeah, they're indigenous to us. Why was the affirmative action law passed and what other laws are passed with it? I asked you guys this question just because you're young, <laughs> mostly. So it's the civil rights laws. Right? When we talk about the civil rights laws, it's not law, it's laws, and affirmative action was to get rid of employment discrimination, right? uh, along with all the other laws that were passed at that time. Voting Rights Act was temporary, uh, but the other laws, some of the other laws are more permanent. So it's a series of laws that are passed. And finally, where was this picture taken? Ah, I'm getting a whole bunch of answers. Washington. Anybody else got a, a guess? Here. Here. Here in Colorado. Colorado Springs, Colorado. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody? Anybody? Omaha, Nebraska. Right. We have stereotypes about where the Klan and white supremacy operates. And this is taken in the early 1930s because in the 1930, it's the end of the big push of immigration into the United States, mostly of whites, but the second part of that second big immigration stream was people coming from Eastern European countries and the Mediterranean, Italians, Greeks, and we freaked out. We had freaked out. So there, you see a rise in the number of white supremacist groups, including the Klan. Uh, and this is a picture that was taken in Omaha, Nebraska, that had one of the highest uh, enrollments in the Klan of any city in the nation at that time. So I love this cartoon. This is done at World War II. What this country needs is a good mental insecticide. You see Uncle Sam spraying an insecticide into a man's brain, and he says, gracious was that in my head. And what comes out is the prejudice bug, right? So I think what our country needs is an insecticide, 
a prejudice insecticide that kind of redoes the way we think about race and ethnicity in our culture uh, and now and into the future. And guess who did this cartoon? Can you see who the author is? Dr. Seuss. One of my favorite cartoons. He does this for the government. This is a government cartoon produced by the federal government. So we have some time for questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Remember, if you don't like this talk, remember the name Jenna Arroyo, right? Questions, any questions that you might have, yeah. So her question was, um, she is uh, uh, interested in criminal justice, majoring in criminal justice, and so there's all these racial disparities in sentencing uh, and prosecutions and et cetera, and so how do we address that? Well, if we had you know, another week, I could tell you about the research that I do, because that's all I do. Hmm? Uh, most of my work is focused on that very, very issue, um, and a lot of my colleagues are doing the same. Um, and there's, I have a model I don't have time to show it to you right now. I have a whole model of where these kind of racial issues can go, can creep into the criminal justice system that would result in disparities. Because um, it can happen at any time from arrest, from stops and frisks, to, to, ex, to being on parole. And who's deemed to be violating parole? To exonerees who have been freed because they were innocent to begin with. So my research has run the gamut from minor infractions like jaywalking uh, against a light to exonerees. But there are other researchers who do this from mine, and mine is a psychological pr perspective and what people make, uh, how they make decisions. But there are other colleagues of mine who do this um, from different perspectives. And it all comes down to kind of basically the same thing. We live in a system who has these, ment we need a mental insecticide. Uh, and, there's, and it's very complicated too. I will say that it's very, also very complicated. Poverty is written into this as well, right? Uh, and I include that in some of the work that I do. So issues of poverty. So all of that's written into this. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Kate yes. Eady from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Yes. My question is about, um, I know that for a lot of people, race becomes a big part of their identity mm -hmm. and there's a big positive Yes. How do we keep that positive cultural attachment yes. from getting rid of the negative of yes. that Oh, that's just so wonderful. So how do we keep, everyone has this kind of sentimental and, and uh, uh, we call affective, affective attachment, a feeling attachment to their race and ethnicity. And so how do we get rid of that? I am, a stand, I am here as a standing representation of being extremely proud. Of, of my ethnicities, right? So the English and Irish and, and also, um, uh, and I won't say I like to drink, okay, I'm not gonna say that. And also, uh, but I do, and also of um, my indigenous heritage. Um, so I don't think that you, I think it really boils down to being really uh, accepting of and loving of everybody's ethnicity. There's a really great, great quote uh, it's by Bell Hooks, and she said, America can't be great until they love blackness, and not just the great stuff of blackness, but the stuff that's wounded and on the floor. We have to love our ethnicities and everything that that entails, uh, because it's what makes us so amazing as a country. It makes us amazing. It makes us more amazing than any other nation on the planet, because we've got more diversity than any other nation outside of Israel, and they're tied together by religion, right? They're a religious state. Um, so, so we have that going for us, but we just have to learn to appreciate it. We've been given this gift. Well, we just have to learn to appreciate it. How do you do that? That's another, I could do a whole other class on that, right? A whole other speak on, speech on that. Yeah. Is that it? I'm, I can't answer anymore, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I'm sorry. It's my fault. <laughs> it's Jenna's fault. <laughs> Thank you very much.